Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Let's start our class. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Sayyidina wa habibina wa shafi'ina. Wa nuri qulubina wa qurati ya'inina muhammadin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa bari wa salim. Noina ta'aluma wa ta'alim wa tazakura wa tazkir. Wa nafa' wa lintifa' wa lifada wa lisifada. Walhasa ala tamasuki bi kitabillahi wa sunnati rasulihi sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa dua ila al-huda wa dalala ala khair ibtigha'a wa jillah wa mardatihi wa qurbihi wa thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala ma'a lutfin wa afiyatin bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma inna nas'adika al-ilma ladunni wa mashraba sawfiya al-haniya wa haab ya ghani Allahumma Inna nasadika la'an maladunni wa mashaba sawfiya lahani ya wahab ya ghani. Allahumma inna nasadika la'an maladunni wa mashaba sawfiya lahani ya wahab ya ghani. Wa sallallahu ala sallina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin amin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let's start with our class. I'm going to open the book that we've been doing. So remunerations refined there. Eh? Hi, Bismillah. Um, let's see. Okay, here. Let's open the book. Let's share the book with you all. Okay. Okay. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So she says here, and the thing, and the thing about reading this book and reading the other book, this one, this this book was written much earlier on, and when she was working with. Um, she Ibrahim, uh, Shkutama. But this book was written, the one that we, the other one that, I, that we also read, it was written, I think, after, mainly after, uh, she came back from Tarim. Right, so there are like more things there, right, from, uh, from Tarim. Right, the other book that we took, the first one, the Light Upon Light, the one I think was really long time ago she wrote, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> I think she wrote that one long time ago. Okay, but we'll just read, uh, through here. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm not gonna read the Malay. Eh? Like, if there's any Malay that appears, I'm not gonna read the Malay. <laughs> right, because I don't, I myself don't really understand Malay very, very well. Um, but the English, yes. Okay, the English, yes. Okay, saints. Working with Shkutama has introduced me to name to numerous devout seekers from different religions. And David is a Catholic, and also the co-partner of Shkutama. In the many hours we've chatted together in the office. And in the car, I've learned so many things about spirituality from him, subhanAllah. One of the things we talked about, we talked was about a book, The Dark Night, by this, the Dark Night of the Soul by a Christian saint, which I first heard about from the Christian CEO I was interviewing. It speaks about how all of us have to go through a dark period of our life before we eventually find solace in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in God. When I told David how I sometimes miss being through trials, because it's when I felt most connected to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And usually it's when, it's when you feel closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you go through difficulty. Right? And alhamdulillah, you know, for difficulty in our lives, um, it, is all part from, it is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us close to him and whether there is difficulty whether there is ease we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us close to him and David replied but the experience was not meant for you to dwell in it was meant to teach you and grow you and it caused you to grow so that others tr uh, so that when others go through the dark night you can light the way from them and for, for them alhamdulillah Allah. all right so Okay, so the ocean of knowledge at Drubat, Singapore, and which is still ongoing. You can go to the school, uh, inshallah. At uh, Drubat, Singapore, one of the teaching methods of the Asatiza is to go through traditional texts word by word, expounding the meaning and the essence of each word. My first, my fiqh textbook is Risal to Jamia, for example. It is a tiny book, and there is only 1.5 cm by 8. It's smaller than my palm of my, of my, of my hand. And it contains 33 pages. And I've already had six months of daily school 
and we are only at page 15. And if you ever learned all these kind of books, you would, it, they're very small, they're very small kind of books. And I hope that you all spend time learning these books. Right? For, for myself, I, I do teach these books. I, I taught Rusal to um, uh, for almost, it's almost almost a year already. My teaching, Rusal to Jamia. It's a very small book. It's a very small book, very thin book. Right, but you can spend. You can, I mean, really, how however long you want to spend on it, you can spend more than a year, two years, you know, of studying the book. You know, mashallah, it is a, it's an amazing text. You know, mashallah, but it's 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 uh basic Islam, right? It's basic belief, it's basic fiqh, and it's also basic um, uh, purification of the heart. Right? It's actually basic Islam, mashallah. Right? but but if you can study the book, then inshallah, it be it be a beneficial book to study. I've already had six months of DD school and we're on page 15. It's mind blowing. It's mind blowing for me each day when I get asked the most simplest questions, which I thought I already knew the answers to, only to realize that I don't. And this is, this is how it is for a lot of us. It is humbling. Right? It is humbling that, and, and it is, this is how we also come to knowledge. And we come to knowledge by reminding ourselves that a lot of things we don't know. Right. And and the and the problem is that many people in this in, in our time, many people think that they know a lot of things. Mm. Many people think they know their religion, they they know Islam, they know, you know, what they need to know about, about their religion. Many people think that. But that's not true. And like most of us, most of us, myself included, most of us, we don't know a lot of things like about our religion. We think we do. Like we think we know a lot of things, but we hardly know anything. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and for what we think we know, but we actually don't. You know, and then and then and then because we think we know, and we think we think we don't have to learn it. We don't have to go for classes, we don't have to study it, and we think that we already know all this stuff. And but the more we think that, the lesser we know. And the more the more we are filled up with ourselves, the lesser we can take in of the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us humility. Right? That is the key to all goodness. The key to all forms of goodness in your life is to be humble. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you humility. Right? So for, for instance, you know, she says, for instance, when we say Alhamdulillah, what does it actually mean? Right? What does it mean to say Alhamdulillah? Right? When you feel in your heart, you know, and when you fill up in your heart, uh, a praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala A gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So when you say Alhamdulillah What does it really mean? Right, sure, yeah, you know It translates it mean, The translation means All praises be to Allah But what does all praise mean? What does all praise mean? And like, what about, you know what, what do you mean when you say You're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And like, what do you feel when you say Alhamdulillah? What does hum, Alhamdulillah really mean? You know, Alhamdulillah is to use all that Allah has given you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to use all that Allah has given you, you know, of, of your own eyes, your, your ears, your heart, your entire body, all of the books that you have, the money that you have, the gadgets that you have, everything that you have in, in life, all of what is given to you, to use all of these things in praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in obedience to Allah. We use all these things to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If only we understood. If only we understood that all of these things that we have in our hands are all trusts. They're all amana. Right? They're all trusts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to use in the best way to get ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does all praise mean? What about when we make a slawat? You know, when we slawat unto our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does the word mean, slawat unto Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? When we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends slawat to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, is it the same as the angels making slawat to us? And the answer is no. I mean, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends slawat right, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means Allah sends his mercy. When the angel sends, when the angels send slawat to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that means the angels ask for forgiveness. Right? Whenever angel sends slawat to us, right, or sends slawat for us, 
it means the angels are asking Allah to forgive us. Is is the angels ask Allah for forgiveness for us? That is the meaning of slawat. When the when it's slawat from the angels, when it's slawat from human beings, what does it mean? Slawat from human beings. Slawat from human beings means that uh to that that to make dua for someone in goodness. So when we all send slawat unto Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we are we are making dua. For Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in goodness, and so mashallah, slawat has a very deep meaning. You know, mashallah. When we say Allah subhanahu wa taala says slawat, what does it all mean? I just told you all that what it, it all mean, means. When we were when we were tote bags, screen printed with I love Allah, does we know? Do we even know what that love means and what it entails? And when you claim to love Allah subhanahu wa taala, and you are claiming that you will try your very best in your in your life. To obey Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and you try your very, very best to do all that you can in your life to stay in obedience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and to stay away from disobedience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. In in Rasala Al Jamia is the but the summary of summaries of fiqh at a kindergarten level textbook. It's a very thin book. It's a very basic thin thin book, and you can go to the most the the most basic books in Islam, and these books will just be the the you know Subhanallah. Uh, you will take a long time to get through these books, and they're just the basic books in Islam. So can you imagine you know what more of higher level books? Uh, can you even imagine how much we don't know? Uh, we really you look at the, at the ocean. The picture here she put she put here in the, in her book, I uh, the ocean in front of you. And this is this is this is basically the, the the knowledge that's out there, and all that we know is just a drop of this ocean. May we always be learning and seeking the light of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Amin. And our concept of time is a fraction of a fraction of a second, and in comparison to the eternal timeline of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, when it slips between the cracks of our grasps. All that we leave behind are memories, stories captured in the hearts of others, and in the many lines written and kept under the arsh or the throne of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. What stories will we leave behind for our children? What stories will future generations hear about us? And most importantly, what stories ourselves will be read? Stories of ourselves will be read to us. On the day of judgment, right? so whatever we are doing right now, we are writing our stories and we are writing our books on the day of judgment that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will see us. Ya Ghafar, grant us an, an easy accounting. Ya Rasulullah, grant us your intercession. Inshallah. Okay, Alhamdulillah. We will. We, I won't read further. I right? we will stop here right, at this point, right? and then we will now um go to our other book, right? Our this book. I right? saw so this book whereby it is. Nearness to you, and nearness to you in getting closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in our path of getting closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I think we're on page fifty-six. Thank you. On page fifty-six of the book, right? And we can read it, right? Insha Allah. <laughs> okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In light of truth, All right? So she says here, in the last pages of my first book, Light Upon Light, by 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 Faila Wahid. I included a passage about how I found peace and contentment in a non-nondescript room with whitewashed walls and shelves lined with sand from the desert outside, reciting Yasin and Qasidas with my schoolmates, a far cry from the happiness I sought in a previous life. You know, when she was when she was younger and what she used to seek of happiness, and she used to think she used to think that. That you know, buying all kinds of things and 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 running after all kinds of fashion, all kinds of all kinds of uh devices, all kinds of gadgets, all kinds of friends, you know, all kinds of lifestyle. I had to run after all these things. I she used to think that all these things would bring her happiness. Right, but right now in this in in this book that we're reading right now on page uh fifty six, right, she's realizing that you know happiness is really closeness. To Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and the sooner we realize that, that the sooner we realize that happiness is closeness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and the sooner we strive to look for happiness right, by getting closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We are all Muslims, Alhamdulillah. All everybody here, we we are all Muslims. 
and we have been most and, and all of us you can say that like all of us are bo- were bo- was born into Islam and like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Islam from birth you know mashallah this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so for us to uh, treasure this right? and to like it's, it's, it's you know to imagine your life without you know being able to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's a terrible life right? it's a very difficult life like, can you imagine how difficult it is if you can't turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or you don't know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's terrible, terrible, it's a terrible, terrible life, you know, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding of this kind of life. And so she said, you know, that, that when, when, she, when she found herself in Tarim, you know, you can see the picture here. Right? This is a picture and you cannot see. Remove my background. Right? If you look into the picture here, like it is the uh okay my husband's post me okay look at the picture here and right, this is in Tarim this is at this is at uh Ainat Shib Shawaka bin Salim's uh grief the ones in <laughs> the black one in black this she probably took a picture of me while I was trapped I was showing her around uh, I was just I was just bringing her around Ziara right in this book right, so basically mashallah like if you if you you know understand. And if you understand, right, that um, being in a very simple environment, in a very simple environment, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all you need is just to sit down at the sajada and learn to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about whatever is going on in your life. And alhamdulillah, you're all young, you're all young women, you know, very young women. And whatever you're going on in your life, you know, subhanallah, from a very young age, learn to just to just be enough for you to, to just turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. You don't need anybody else except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She says here in the book, right, on page 56, I was briefly transported back to that moment that as I came f- across the following verse, truly those who believe shall be addressed. Right, Allah's... Um, Odium, right? Odium is a general disgust or loathing incurred by someone as a result of their actions is greater than your odium of yourself. Right? When you were called to believe, then disbelieved. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you right, to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to be closer to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's true, no matter how much we deny it. It's true, no matter how much we deny it. The soul knows when we have sinned or disbelieved, and we and we know we know when what we have done is wrong, and we can feel it in our hearts. We can feel it in ourselves that if if we have done something that is wrong, you can actually sense it. You can feel it, and if you can't feel it, then there's even there's a, there's a bigger problem because if you can't feel that you have sinned, or if you can't feel that you have done wrong, right, then that means your heart is dead, and that's if there's a bigger problem. It's a bigger problem. It cries out in sadness and disgust. In pain and disappointment, the first sin committed is always the hardest hit because the soul's purity is tarnished. Right, the first sin right, that, that is done. And I remember, and I, I have friends, you know, mashallah, I have friends who, you know, their entire lives, they would never miss a prayer. Then the first time they miss a prayer, they feel the pain of it. When they miss a prayer on purpose, the first time they miss a prayer on purpose, right, they feel the pain of it. But as they miss more and more prayers, they begin to get more and more numb towards it. They begin to get more and more, you know, indifferent right, towards it. And that's a calamity. Yeah? That's a terrible thing to happen to a person. Right? When you feel more and more, you know, unaffected right, by doing things against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know of people who also, you know, the first time right, they, do, they, 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 they put on clothes right, that are, are not, that, 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 that they're not in line with our religion the first time they put it on you know, and the first time they, they rebel right, against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first time they do it it's always the, the, the hardest it's actually always the hardest but the more they do it the more they do it the more they do it it gets easier and easier that's how sin is eh? the first time people do it which is why, which is why don't, don't even do it the first time I don't, even, don't even try it the first time right? because it actually you know with of course you know with 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 doing something over and over again, people get more and more numb towards it. Same thing like lying. You know, the first time someone lies, right, they feel scared. But after a while, you know, when they realize that lying 
doesn't really have that many consequences in this world. And there's a lot of consequences in the hereafter, in the next world. Right? But if you realize that the consequences are not, are not that bad, they begin to lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. And they become chronic liars. And this is terrible. Eh? May Allah protect us and keep us um, pure on the path. Right? So she says here, the first sin committed is always the hardest hit. I remember when I did something I wasn't supposed to in my turbulent years. I stared at the mirror and I cried because I could not recognize myself. Like what I first when I when I first did, when she first did something that was so wrong, right? She could not recognize herself. In retrospect, it was perhaps my soul knew I had taken the first forays into disbelief. I have taken the first the first uh, steps into being far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's always painful for the soul to be far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's always painful for the soul right, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then she says, so she says the first lie, right, the first time you lie, the first forbidden touch, right, the first time, the first alcoholic drink, right, may Allah protect us from all of these things. You know, may Allah keep all of you pure. I away from all of these things, stay away from all from, from, from lying, from 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 haram touches, right? From the alcoholic drinks, stay away, stay far, far away. The first step into a forbidden place will always be accompanied by a sadness, guilt, and loathing from the soul. Right? Inside your heart you'll feel sadness right? about it. You'll feel you'll feel disgusted with yourself. But Shaitan, he comes. And then he tries to make you feel comfortable with it. He tries to make you feel accustomed and, and normalized right, by it. And then he makes you do it more and more and more. Right? And that's how you get harder and harder and harder and further and further and further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to stay close to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then shaitan comes and distracts us. And dresses all the heedlessness in beauty. And Shaitan whispers to you and says, Ah, this is happiness. Ah, this is enjoyment. Ah, this is the life. And Shaitan begins to whisper all kinds of things to you. I right, to get you onto his side. But on whose barometer of happiness and contentment are we basing our life on then? Shaitans, you know, who are we, who are we basing our life on? Are we basing our happiness on what shaitan tells us? Or should we base our happiness on what Allah tells us? Right now, truth always dispels falsehood. Darkness is merely an absence of light. So the, so even no matter how far shaitan has pulled a person into what kind, what, whatever form of sin, and shaitan can, do, you know, shaitan can do that. He can pull someone into all kinds of terrible sin. You know, that, 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 that he does, shaitan, but it's just a matter of just turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A moment of just turning back, running back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking. It's a moment of repentance. It's so easy. It's so easy. Just to feel, you know, remorseful, to feel regretful, and then run to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just, just to do that, right, straight away the darkness goes away and light enters. As God's light enters into our hearts, and our lives again, the gems that shaitan tempts us with will reveal themselves as worthless stones. Hey, shaitan, it's a story of a man, you know, whereby he used to go to this, um, it's, it's, it's a story of a man who used to go to this masjid, you know, and he would study with his teacher at this masjid. So every morning, right, this man would come to the masjid, you know, and he would sit down in the first row, right, and he would study with his teacher, no, whatever lah that they will study, whether it's fiqh, whether it's akida, or just any any things about, you know, a, um um anything about about uh the religion, and right? he would study with the sheikh, you know, every morning. So some so after some time, right, the sheikh began to realize that this man stopped showing up, that right? this man stopped coming, right, to the classes. So the sheikh was like, you know, has anyone seen so and so? Has anyone seen so and so? And they said he's not coming anymore. He stopped coming. And the Shaykh said, why? Does anyone know why he stopped coming? And then they all didn't know. Right? So the Shaykh went to the house of the person, you know, and the Shaykh said to the, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the student, to the house of the student, and the Shaykh, you know, um, knocked the door and, and, and asked the student. The student was there. 
You know, and the students saw the Shay. The student was like, Oh, Shay, come in, come in, come in. You know, um, it's an honor to have you come to my house. It's an honor. Come in. And the Shay said, I have a question for you. Like, why do you stop coming for the classes? And the man said, Oh, Shay, you know, you know, I love your classes and I, I will always come for your classes. I, but, you know, in the past few days, something amazing has happened to me. You know, something amazing has happened. And then she said, what, what, what is it that has happened to you? And then the man said, well, you know, right after I pray subo, you know, I fall asleep. And in my sleep, I have a, an amazing dream. It happens every single morning after subo. And when I pray, I, I go into this, this amazing dream. And it's a very long dream. Whereby I go to Jannah, Sheikh. I go to Jannah. You know, I am brought to Jannah and I see the delights of Jannah. And in my dream, you know, I get I get to see all the amazing things in Jannah. And then I am brought back to my bed and then I wake up. And by the time I wake up, it's after your class, oh Sheikh. Your, your class has ended by the time I wake up. So I always end up missing your class. And the she was thinking, this is very fishy. Right? Sleep after Subo, some dream, he goes to Jannah, he only comes back after the, cl the class ends. So the she said to the, to the student, I think you're being played with. I think Shaitan is playing with you. Right? The Shaitan is playing with you. I think the Shaitan is playing with you. And then the student said, No, 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 she, it's not Shaitan. Let me you know, I, let me tell you, it's not shaitan. I'm very sure, right? That this um, I'm very sure that what I'm experiencing, right? It is correct, right? It is 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 definitely it happens every day. So she said, no. Let me let me tell you, I I I can see the signs, right? It's 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 obviously it's not real. Uh, you're just being you're being messed with with shaitan. So the student didn't want to believe the sheikh, and the sheikh said, okay, tell you what. While you're on this travel of yours, right? After you sleep and you go on this travel and you go into this, into, into, into Jannah, so-called, right? Wake up halfway. Stop the dream halfway and wake up halfway. And see where you're at. And you see where you're at. So the boy, the man said, okay, okay, fine, fine. I will do this. I'll do that. But I, I, I tell you, I'm in Jannah. I go to Jannah every single morning. After I pray subuh, I go to Jannah. By the time I come back, I miss your class. And she said, okay, do it. Tomorrow, do it. And tell me what happens. So the next day, right, the student actually um shows up for class, but a bit late lah. Shows up for class. And after the class, she says to the student, So do you do do you do as I told you to do? And the student the student looked very, very ashamed, very, very shy. And he said, Yeah, I did. You know, halfway through the dream, right, I forced myself to wake up from my dream and I found myself in a garbage dump. And she said, that's that's what I thought. Every day, Shaitan brings you to the garbage dump. And then he brings you back just to miss your lesson. And just and see, I told you, right, the very fact that you miss out on a sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam is a sign. This is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's from Shaitan. Right, whenever you are made to miss out a sunnah or a wajib, never think it's from Allah. It's confirmed from Shaitan. Right, confirmed is Shaitan who's making you miss out on what is good. And he's trying to make you, make you miss out on your classes. He's trying to make you, make you miss out on your, you know, on, on, on staying up after Subo. Uh, he's doing all kinds of things, Shaitan. I uh, should never think that, oh, and he's going to he's gonna disguise it by, by making, seem, making it seem as if, oh, it's in Jannah, it's in Jannah. But it's not in Jannah. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the rubbish dump. <laughs> he, he brings you to the rubbish dump every day and then he brings you back uh, into your, you know, into your, into your house. Inshallah. Okay, so always understand. Right, that Shaitan, Shaitan's plans and his plots are very, very lousy. He's not a very good planner, Shaitan. Right, his, his plots are easily dismissed. So as Allah's light enters into our hearts and our lives again, the gems that Shaitan tempts us with reveal themselves to be worthless stones. And it could even be feces. <laughs> right, Shaitan will make it seem as if it's gem. Right, but it's not gems. It's just worthless stones. Or even najis. Right, Shaitan makes it seem like najis. The soul sees and breathes again as we start hacking the hardness that has encrusted in our hearts and blinded our eyes and, and minds. And so finally, when the soul finds itself seated in the company of true beauty, 
Like when you are in the company of the righteous, of those who are pious, people who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will see what is true beauty. Happiness and contentment that transcends the physical world. It sheds tears, it sheds tears of gratitude and ultimately relief for being guided back to belief. Alhamdulillah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you back to what is true and what is right. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. And in the next page, many amongst us choose to hide our true selves, our dreams and our fears, our visions and our struggles because we are afraid of being called a fluke, afraid of falling or failing openly, afraid of all the things that others might say. But have we got forgotten to hear the wonderful things our souls have to say and for us to visit uh, for us to remember that we are on our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah okay all right i'm gonna put this here all right we're gonna switch to our let me just see the question here okay all right a few questions once you repent will the sin you did Will the sin you just did be counted in the hereafter? Inshallah, no. Right, inshallah, no. Right, so once you repent, whatever sin that you have performed, it will be re- it will be removed. But on condition that your repentance is um is sincere, right, you must be sincere in your repentance. And what is sincere in your repentance? It means you really feel sorry about it, right, and and you can't fake feeling sorry. You can't. And no matter that, like, you know how, how sometimes, you know, like your parents make you say sorry to your siblings. Like, if it's fake, you can, you can hear it. You can hear the fakeness. Nobody can, nobody can, 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 can fake sincerity. Sincerity is that it's not possible to fake it. Right? So, Allah knows. Right? So, Allah knows if you sincerely repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are sincerely, you know, you're sincere about it, Allah will accept it. No matter how many times you repent, there is a hadith where a man commits a sin and he turns to Allah and says, Ya Allah, forgive me for the sin that I committed. And he was sincere and Allah forgave him. Then after some time, he did the same sin again. And he fell into the same sin again. Then he turns to Allah and he's sincere again to Allah and he says, Ya Allah, please forgive me for the sin that I have committed. And Allah forgives him. And then he, he, and then he carries on and then he commits the same sin again that time round. Right, and he keeps he keeps committing the sin over and over again. And every single time he commits a sin, he will ask Allah sincerely. There's a key. Sincerely, he will ask Allah to forgive him. And Allah will forgive him. Right. So it it is only when you are not sincere in asking Allah um that, that you'll not be that, that we don't know, right? But that is where we say we will not, you'll not be forgiven when you're not sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But is it that if I keep asking Allah to forgive me over and over again? Can Allah forgive me over and over again? The answer is yes. As long as each and every time you are sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it's a million times you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask Him to forgive you. Even if it's a million times, you know. Right? If every single time you are sincere, if every single time you are sincere, then uh, uh, Allah will forgive you. And it's a good question. Somebody asks, how to be sincere? How do I make myself sincere? First and foremost, First and foremost, sincerity, you feel sorry about it. Right? You need to feel sorry about it. You need to actually feel bad about it. Right? And then you say, how do I feel bad about it? When you realize what, what, what the, the, the sin that you have committed, and when you realize, for example, if you lied to your parents, for example, you need to feel bad about it. Right? If you don't feel bad about it, you don't have any sincerity whatsoever. Right? And until you feel bad about it, you, have to feel, you, actually, you actually have to feel bad about the sin. You actually have to feel, you know, guilty, right? If you feel bad. And if you don't feel guilty, you don't feel bad, then there's a problem in your heart that you don't feel um, any form of guilt whatsoever that you have committed something that is wrong. Like, you know, like, like what, kind of, what kind of heart is that? Right? And if you feel that, that, okay, I did something wrong and I feel no guilt about it, right? then that's, this is like, like a red alarm bell <laughs> for you, you know, like a red light. You know, to 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 it's 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 shocking. Right? You don't feel bad about it. You did something wrong. You don't feel bad about it. Then ask Allah to make you feel bad about it. Right? If you like, for example, if someone were to if someone were to miss the prayer, they miss one solat, and they feel nothing about missing the solat. Right? This is this is a terrible uh situation to be in. 
you should never you should never find yourself in that in that situation but if let's say you find yourself in that situation whereby you miss zuhur and you couldn't care less oh la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah but if you couldn't care less then then this is like a big alarm bell right because it shows the hardening of your heart your heart is hardening right so if you feel no guilt and no pain and no remorse with sin then you better sit down and beg allah Uh, you better you better sit down and be serious about your religion and beg Allah to fill your heart with remorse and regret. I ask Allah to fill your heart, and with remorse and regret, sincerity comes very 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 um uh, easily, because you're, you're you're regretful. You feel so bad about it. So you say, Yeah, Allah, Yeah, Allah. I promise you, Yeah, Allah. I promise you, I'll never do it ever again. I'm sincere. I promise. I promise. I'm not playing around. The opposite of sincerity is that you're playing around, you're fooling around, and right? so and you know, you know when you say to Allah, Yeah, Allah, I promise you, I will not do it ever again. I promise you, I will not do it ever again. You know, if you're fooling around or if you're sincere about it, you yourself know it, right? Like you say to your mother, I promise, I I will never forget to do this ever again. I promise, I'm gonna try my very best. I promise you, I promise you, right? You say to your mother and you and you, and you ask for her forgiveness, right? But if you know you're not being sincere. If you know you're not being you're not being uh you know true to your words, you it just it just at your lips it just lip service, and then after that when your mother turns her back you do it again, right? That's it's called being you know uh being hypocritical, it's being a hypocrite, and right? may Allah protect us from this. So how do we actually repent? Basically, feel sorry about what you have done, ask Allah for forgiveness, and never do it ever again. That's it, right? That's it. Right. So feel sorry for what you have done. Ask Allah for His forgiveness and resolve. Right. That means have a strong determination in yourself, never to do it ever again. Right. You know, you try your very best. It's called repentance. I right? try your very best. You know, mashallah. Um, it's a funny story. Right? But but basically, this, I wanted to mention the story because of of what has been going on. You know, amongst our youngsters. Right. So it uh. <laughs> There's this uh, story about this the sheikh, you know, and you can actually find all these you know stories of uh, um, uh, if you, if you can find, uh, you can find all these stories online, a lot of stories online, you know, and 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 that day I was I was listening to some stories like on people who saw very very bad deaths, they see bad deaths. There's one sheikh. Right, he goes around and he handles very, he handles really bad janaza. His job is to do that because people are terrified to handle bad janaza. Right, so you ever seen a bad janaza? It's terrifying. I've never seen one in my life before. Alhamdulillah, all the janazas that I've handled or that I've seen are all good janazas, and they're all full of light and smiling and 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 and, and joyous, you know, the hereafter. Right, but but if you've ever seen a bad janaza. There was one. This one, the sheikh um, described, you know, whereby he was driving the janaza to the to the to the to the uh, to the cemetery, right? When you know, while they were driving the janaza to the cemetery, they could smell, right? They could smell like as if something really burning, right, inside the car, right? And they, they checked the car. They checked. The, they stopped the car because the smell was so strong and so bad. Like something was like on fire, right? There was like a st- it smelled as if there was there was something really burning, like barbecued, you know, completely burnt. So they checked the car, they checked the engine, they checked everything. They were looking here, looking there. They couldn't find anything wrong with the car, and then they kept smelling the the burnt smell from coming coming from inside the car, right? So on the back part of the car. So when they opened up the back part of the car. I right, saw the janaza was like the 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 kafan right. They had wrapped the janaza in. It was completely black. Right, the whole thing was black. Right, and the person inside was completely like 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 you would say like 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 a shrivel. Like it was like a black piece of wood. It looked like a back like 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 a, like a completely burnt match. You know, like a matchstick when it's burnt like that. It was it was completely burnt. Right, and then when the sheikh asked about this, who's the janaza and why is the janaza like that? Right, and then he was said that this janaza, you know, it is it is how you help you 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 use you, you soften your heart, you know, you break your heart with regards to sins. So this janaza was actually a woman, right, and this woman 
worked in that hospital over there that we just came from. And she said, what what happened right, to this woman? Why is her janazah, you know, burnt like a matchstick? Right? Why is she, why is she that's, like in that way? And they said that, well, this woman was a doctor right, who worked in the, in the, in the, um, you know, in, in the hospital, you know, and this woman, right, she, and it was a Muslim country, I think it was in, in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or something, it was a Muslim country, right, but she, you know, she would not cover her aurat, and she would come in the shortest skirts, and she would wear, like, the tightest clothes, she's a Muslimah, Muslimah, eh? <laughs> subhanAllah, she's a Muslimah, she would come in the worst, like, you see, you see the worst dressing, but, of course, you know, in, in their definition, to them, like, the most fashionable lah, Right, shortest skirt she would come to work. Right, and she would wear the tightest clothes and then she would she would do her hair and everything. So I'm thinking, kind of doctor. If you're a doctor, why you care so much about all these things? <laughs> doctor, right? like, just be be more professionally dressed, la. I mean they have to be so like, you know, ridiculous in their dressing. Right, but she would wear these kind of things. Like completely revealing clothes. Right? And whenever anybody would try and advise her, you know, and say that, you know, at least, you know, wear something longer. You know, do not wear something so short? And she just dismissed them. And she wear like the, the highest heels and everything. So basically, it was her high heels that was the problem. She was walking down the stairs. And when her, uh, she tripped. I you know how scary it is to, to, to trip down a flight of steps, right, wearing high heels. Right? You know how, it, it can cost your life, eh? It can cost your life. There are many people, there, there are many stories of people who lose their lives falling down stairs. Because you think about it, the stairs... There are many sharp edges, right? Think about it. There are many sharp edges in the stairs. So if you if you land wrongly, you know, it's really, it's really by Allah's mercy that if you ever fall down a flight of steps, like for me, alhamdulillah, I've never fallen down a flight of steps in my life. <laughs> and I hope you all have never actually experienced falling down a flight of steps in your life. Can you imagine how scary it actually, it actually you know, it sounds to actually fall down a flight of steep steps, especially the very steep ones. It is, I, get, I get very scared whenever I climb down mountains and you climb down the very steep steps. You know, especially at Jabanu, at, at Mecca. Get, get, get Mecca, if you fall down and you die, okay lah, not bad. At least you die in Mecca, right? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a bad deal. <laughs> it's quite good actually to die in Mecca. Right? Especially you go to Jabal Jabanur and you come down and you die. <laughs> right? it's, it's not so bad. Right? But basically she was in whatever she was wearing, in a very tight skirt, in a very tight, you know, clothes and a very revealing clothes and everything. She was wearing very high stilettos, as a very high um heels, and she tripped. She just tripped, and she fell tumbling down the stairs, and she died, on the spot. She died. Right? It's, 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 it's not it's not it's not uh impossible eh? It's the, it has happened several times. There was another story I I, I read before about a, a doctor who told his patient, "You have three days to live." And the patient says to the doctor, "How do you know how many days people have to live?" And the doctor says, well, the records show you have three days to live. Doctor, doctor walks off, he walks on the stairs, he trips, he falls, he dies. So while he who's telling his own patient he had three more days to live, he had three more seconds to live. And he didn't even know. He didn't even realize that he had three more seconds to live. Right, so anyway, the story of this woman, right? Um, true story, you can find it online. Uh, the, the Sheikh tells the story. It's in English. You can actually find the stories all in English. I was, I was listening to all the stories of the Janazah. It's quite scary. It's very scary. And these are things that they were, they were like, if you feel yourself being lazy about worship, then go and watch all these stories. <laughs> they have stories about people who don't pray. They have stories about people who would, um, of course, show off the outright like this woman. They have stories about people who would, uh, were rude to their parents. There was a man who was very rude to his mother. And when he passed away, he had ants crawling out of his nostrils and his ears and his mouth and his private parts. Ants were crawling out from inside his body, you know, and they were biting, they were biting him all around, right? So, um, I'll, I'll answer the question, you know, in a while. Uh, but basically, this lady, you know, she, her, her janaza was completely burnt to black, right, because of the amount of sins that she was committing, right? But it's a good question here. Someone says, you know, but if this lady is a doctor, right, um, you know, shouldn't she be forgiven for helping people? It depends on her intention. It depends on her intention. If she intended to help people by being a doctor, right? She also has to understand that she is a, a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she needs to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because who, who is the one who gave her the ability to help other people? Who? Who is the one who gave her the ability to help other people? 
Allah, right? Allah gave her the intellect, Allah gave her the physical ability, Allah gave her the health, Allah gave her everything. Right? Even the opportunity to be a doctor is an opportunity right? to be a doctor. Allah gave her everything. Right? But for all we know, her intention was not to help, was, was to earn money. For all you know. Right? For all you know, her intention was to show off. Right? If her intention was to, was to earn money and to show off, then there's no reward. Right? There's zero for her. Every day she goes to work, all she wants to do is to show off her body and to show off how you know amazing she is. And she couldn't care less about helping people. And there are some doctors who are like that. All they want, all they're concerned about is to earn as much money as possible. Right? Helping people is not in their intention. Some people are like that. You know, some people could be a road sweeper right? and their intention is to help people. Right? To keep the roads clean. Right? So you don't have to be like you know, some sort of big shot doc- doctor to help people. Right? You can be a cook and you can be helping people. I know of a woman you know, in Singapore right now, I know of a woman, she herself is poor, but every weekend she will cook for the poor in her neighborhood. She herself is poor, you know. She herself is poor and every weekend she will cook for the poor in her own neighborhood. In her own small kitchen, in her one room flat. You know, mashallah. Do you have to be a big shot doctor to be to, to, to be helping people or not? I, or you just you know, just, just in your own one room flat, you know, in your small kitchen, small stove, like small perio, you cook food for the kampung. And you cook food for the entire, you know, all the Muslims in the area she was cooking cook food for. And even a non Muslim, she would just give food right, to so many people. And she herself poor. So you will give her money to try and, you know, uh, support. Because she can, I can, I can cook. <laughs> I can cook for like hundreds of people, <laughs> but she can. Uh, she's able to do it, right? But she has no money for it. So you get the money. So we have, we have the money. You get the money, you know, mashallah. right? So you can't, you can't tell, you know, you know how these people are. You know, subhanallah. Um, it's on YouTube. I saw all all these stories on YouTube. This is Sheikh who actually tells all these stories, you know, of people who have bad um bad endings. Right, so it, uh, you know, mashallah, right. So of course, really, whether whether or not she's forgiven, and from and from the way she passed away, and you can see her janaza being all burnt black, these are all signs that she was not forgiven, right? Because she's being she's being burnt black. It means Allah knows that she was arrogant, right? Allah knows that she was disobedient to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah knows that she didn't do any of what she did for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah knows it. And said, Allah will be the judge. Allah knows what's in your heart. And said, Allah knows if you're sincerely doing things for Allah or you're not doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows. Alright? So, it, um, uh, someone asked the question, if someone gives you something that is not halal and you eat it, <laughs> why you eat it for? <laughs> what, what are you supposed to do? Okay, maybe you didn't know lah, eh? Right, maybe someone give you a drink. You like you you see as a Muslim give you a drink or something. You thought okay, it's halal. You ate it, and then you're like, hey, and your 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 friend tells you that's not halal, you know. And you're like, huh? <laughs> but the Muslim machi gave me at the masjid. <laughs> How you would not suspect that the machi at the masjid gave you something that was not halal, <laughs> right? You won't think you won't think twice, right? You just eat it, right? And then they realize that. But basically, if you do it on not on purpose, it's, it's not sinful. Whatever you do that is not on purpose, it's not sinful. All right. So just you know, just 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 the dala. You, you can't take it out of your body. It's in your body already. <laughs> stop eating it, lah. <laughs> you know, stop eating it. Then then dala. Right. You can you can istighfar, istighfar, and ask Allah to remove the the bad effects of the of a non halal food, right? But it's done. Right. It's all done. And you didn't do it on purpose. If you did it on purpose, then you are sinful. If you're sinful, you must seek Allah's forgiveness. If you were tasked to help around and you are, and you find and you tell yourself, fine, I'll do it for Allah, uh, for the pahala, right? Will it be counted as sincere good deed? Will the pahala be found be counted? Yes, as long as it's sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you say fine. <laughs> like you like like kela, 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 I do la I do. Right? So even though your 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 tone might sound not the most pleasing own to give your mother like your mother says can you help me wash the plates okay you know <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer eh? then they say okay always me get pahala lah like, but such a negative tone 
so negative. Can you be more cheerful? Like, so, 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 uh, will the reward be counted? Inshallah. Inshallah counted. Doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not doing it to get some, you know, chocolate or whatever, right? <laughs> You're not trying to get some money out of it. Like, you're just doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's good. Okay, it is bad to love Allah and worship Him because you want to go to Jannah. That is how Allah has taught us. Uh, Allah has taught us in the Quran uh, to worship Him and to obey Him because He promises us Jannah. So Allah Himself has taught us about that. Like he is the one because He knows not everybody can just do things um, without something in it for them. Right? I mean, most human beings, there's something in it for us. And especially for bad things. Right? Because we know there's a punishment. Uh, that makes us wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning and pray to Right? Because we know there's a punishment. Right? If, if, if no one says, oh, there's no punishment, just wake up if you want to wake up at 6 a.m. Most people will sleep right through. <laughs> Most people will not wake up. They will sleep right through. Right? Especially like those who cannot pray when you're on your menses. You, you just sleep right through. Because you know that it's not wajib and on you when you're on your menses. Correct? You can see it, right? Like, see, see how the human being works? When you're promised a reward, that like you kind of get more enthusiastic about it. <laughs> when you are threatened a punishment, you get more serious about it also. Right? Human beings are like that. We all we all like that. We are like that. So Allah knows that we are like that. Like you, you, you human beings, you're all like that. So at least, you know, when if you're asking what is sincere and what is not sincere, non sincere is doing it for people. That means doing people meaning you want people to praise you. Uh, you want to be popular with the people. You want people to see you know, uh, to, 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 to say, to, to, to praise you lah. But if you're doing it for Allah, in that you want Allah's jannah, uh, you want Allah's reward, you want Allah to praise you, uh, you want Allah to look at you, that one's okay. Okay, that one's okay. Right, so if let's say, if I, you know, recite Quran, and I recite Quran because I know the reward of, of reading Quran, and I want the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's okay. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. I, but if you're reading Quran and you just want that people hear, you know, what you read, then that's different now. Nah. Right, so if you just want, it was the story of the man I told you all about, the man who, we read about the story of the man who was reading Quran in Ramadan. Then when he heard somebody outside his door, he raised his voice so that the person can hear him reading Quran early in the morning. And after he, he fell asleep and he saw in his dreams, Right, that on the day of judgment, that pages that he read out loud for someone else to hear was all blank. There was no, there was, there was no reward for those pages that he read out loud to to show off to people. Uh, but those that he read for Allah, there were reward. There was reward for it, right, for him. You know, mashallah. Right, so it um, you know, mashallah, do it for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's okay. Right, so if you if you if you're worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for paradise, that's okay because that's in the Quran. Allah tells us about paradise for a reason. I right, to encourage us right, to do what is good. What if you miss your morning with it and you realize it and you realize in the afternoon can you still do your morning with it? Yes, you can. You can still do your morning with it in the afternoon and your night with it in the morning. You can still do it later on. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um any other questions? No other questions. Then I want to uh <laughs> this is Saadia. Where were we in the sto- in the in our Final legacy, eh? Were we in here? Episode episode three, is it? Abraham initially, right? You got destroyed, right? So all done, right? Okay, this man here, this young man here, is Waraka bin Naufal, the actor lah, right? Waraka is acting Waraka bin Naufal. He will be an old man when by the time Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam um is raised to be a prophet. So this is the year Nabi Muhammad sallam was born. So you can imagine that right now you look at him, he's about thirty years old around there, right? Or maybe thirty, thirty, almost, almost maybe forty years old. So this was the the year Nabi Muhammad sallam was born. So when Rasulullah sallam got his first revelation, Nabi Muhammad sallam was forty years old. When he got his first, it means 40 years from now. Right? So you can imagine him to be 80 years old. 
I somewhat like 80 years old. If it's 40 here, I already 30 here. I'm just like a young man. I right? 30 here. I right? probably around 70s. In his 70s, right? Then he got the message that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh uh just got revelation. Fall on the, on the earth means give birth. When you give birth to him, say these words. Right, to protect him from the evil of every every envier. And name him Muhammad. She had a dream. Right? So was it she had a dream? And sometimes she hear, she heard this, the voice while she was awake. Right, so you can see in the uh the the Jews, the Jews are all shouting. Right? They, they, they see the star in the sky, the star that shows the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They all know about it. So they know Nabi Muhammad sallam has been born. So the, Ma the Magians, they are fire worshippers. They are all the way in Persia. Persia is Iraq or Iran. Today's Iraq or Iran. So they had a huge fire there that has been burning for 1,000 years. Can you imagine? Like 1,000 years fire has been burning. Um, of course, they all kindle the fire. Lah. They pretend as if it's been burning for 1,000 years, but actually they've been kindling it. Right? But when Rasulullah was born, the night when he was born, the entire huge fire got put out. Right? And that was the fire that they worshipped. They they actually worship that huge fire, right? The fire was put out, right? Um, and then the a light lit the palaces of Sham. They could see everyone, everyone who was alive at that time, right, at that zaman saw the light. They came when with the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, uh, uh, someone asked the question, why did they say Ahmad? The Jews said Ahmad. Uh, because the name of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their book is Ahmad. Uh, Rasulullah had his name on earth is Muhammad. His name in the heavens is Ahmad. Right? And he has 99 names. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also has 99 names. Right? So he has a lot of names. Eh? I, have, I have it on my, on my wall. The names of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, there are 99 names of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like Muddathir, Muzzamil, Mujbashir, Muzzamil. Uh, Munzir, so all the names, Mustafa, so all the different names of, of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Taha, Yasin, Hamim, these are all the different names of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Ahmad is one of his names. Right? The Jews are the people who who, are, who, who follow Nabi Musa Alaihi Salam. They rejected Nabi Isa and they are waiting for the last prophet. But they were also 
They're, so, they're supposed to believe Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but they reject Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So they say that Amina is going to give birth. So on the night where she gives birth, that light spreads all over the land. Okay, inshallah. This is Baraka. I tell you about Baraka before, right? She loved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so much like a mother. She was a, she's, a, she's a young girl here. She's about a teenager at this point that Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. But, but uh, she will outlive Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she loved him very much. Uh, and he also loved her very much like a mother. Not like his own mother. Because right? she looked after him when, she, when he was a baby. Eh? MashaAllah. You, can see, you will see the story like how, he, uh, how she was there the entire time. From the time he was born until he passed away, so the barakah was always there. And inshallah. We do our dua. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah.